The Very Serious Crafts podcast is on Patreon. Visit patreon.com slash serious crafts to support our podcast. Find out about our Patreon half-stitched episodes and more. Hello and welcome to season four, episode 14 of the Very Serious Crafts podcast. I'm Molly from Wild Olive. And I'm Haley from Red Handled Scissors and the Bones and Bobbins podcast. Today, we'll be talking about creative flair from the past. Yes. It's Ooh, true. I like it. Yeah. But before we jump into that, per usual, we would like to give a shout out to our Very Serious Crafts podcast friends who are supporting us on Patreon. Uh, you guys are the best. Obviously. And also... If you happen to be listening to this episode and you don't know, there is an entire back catalog, many seasons of half-stitched bonus episode recordings waiting for you if you join us on Patreon. And they are a little... They're a little quirky. Um... And a lot of fun. And by quirky, I mean, if you like us, you'll really like them. If you, if you don't, <laughs> I mean, well, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, um, you should join us because there is so much additional fun content. And we go down rabbit holes with unabashed glee. Yes. Yes, we do. Always. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Always and then some, I think. Oh, yeah. Uh, but yeah, so today, though, on this particular regular episode, Rabbit Hole. Yes. Uh, we're, we're here to discuss some historical crafts that inspire us. And I don't know, maybe I've, I want to make sure that I understand this clearly. Like, because I would say that a lot of crafts that we have now are historical and maybe that could like play into what you what you appreciate about them but like maybe more specific things that that really impress or or inspire us is that accurate is that where we're yeah, going yeah so yeah okay i'm thinking about the projects of old um mm -hmm. so generally speaking um antique or historic projects that i look at when I want to have my creativity feel refreshed, when I want to remember the things that made me want to do this to begin with. And um, just the things that I think are neat, because a lot of times what we think of as modern takes on like embroidery, cross stitch, whatever, yeah. are actually very, very old takes on it that have just, um, they just look fresh again because yeah. design aesthetics have changed. And I think a really good example of that is probably my favorite thing. And I've definitely talked about this on a previous podcast episode, but I love Quaker samplers. Yeah. Because they are, I mean, sometimes they're black work. Sometimes they are colorful, but not uh, in a very specific way. Not uh, in sort of a almost muted tones, but mm -hmm. sometimes very saturated muted tones, if that makes sense. So like very saturated rusts and dark blues and just things like that. And I love them for reasons that people would probably think that I would hate them, <laughs> which is they are not, they're very geometric, which I absolutely yeah. love about them and they are generally speaking cross stitch i don't think i've ever seen one that wasn't cross stitch right and they often include the normal things that samplers do so like either a small bible verse or an alphabet um, if there's 
Yeah, an yeah. alphabet numbers. If they're um, student done, they will almost always have that plus the name and the year. Um, sometimes they will have family information, but they also have these geometric almost snowflake looking motifs Mm -hmm. that are either around it or in borders and they are not necessarily centered they yeah they're they're not all symmetrical occasionally you see one that is yeah but and i mean the designs themselves are symmetrical but the they are piece, not yeah. necessarily symmetrically stitched yeah. on the piece. Yeah. They might be offset yeah. by a few, um, or by a few squares. Yeah. And so I, I just really like them because it's so hard to make something like that look good and on purpose and not like a mistake. Yeah, and all of these look or all of them that i have seen that are really cool examples they look really really on purpose they they do not look as though someone has miscounted and i just i love them i also love like um black work and red work and stuff like that and this is very very heavily borrowing from a lot of those traditions in this in this category. First of all, I I wanted to be like looking at some of these while we were discussing them. Yeah. So I have just found a link that you absolutely need to see if you haven't seen already. I, I put it into our little document so that you can find it. It's under the show notes section. Wait till you see this. I'm gonna we're gonna pause while Haley clicks and it loads up. Have, has it come up yet? Do you see what this is? You know what's funny? I posted yesterday on my instagram stories Uh maybe something by yeah this um so but it's it's a this is a a (laughs) quaker style sampler but it is all halloween themed so there's there's several witches i am utterly there's uh like a little pumpkin person couple pumpkin people um all that sort of thing you know and Lots of black yeah, cats. Yeah, crows, some dragons, all of you know. But ghosts. the words I think are maybe my favorite. Yeah. Owls, creepy uh-huh. bats, cats. Yep. October thirty first, and then there's a year, yeah. um, which would need to be. Yeah, be yeah, updated. yeah. But it's very. But it's it's adorable. Now, yeah, it's it's like all of my interest yeah. meeting in yep. one place. Candles, we've got candles. Yeah, it's good. Um, so a friend of mine recently purchased a sampler kit it's not quite the the quaker style if i recall i'll have to find a link for it but it's a it's a dinosaur sampler that is just it's wonderful and when when she showed me that i instantly started thinking i really 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 want to design a cross stitch sampler in this in this uh, feeling, you know, the like the the dinosaur one she she has, and then this one. Yeah, um, I'll find that dinosaur one to put in the show notes. It's it only comes as a kit from Russia. It's expensive, but it's gorgeous. So, uh, but I just that like you said, like a historical craft that inspires us now. Uh, this is this is perfect. It's perfect for that. I love it. They blow my yeah. mind. Every time I look at them and every time I see new examples, it's one of those things that just makes me immediately want to go off and design a yes. thing like that. Or uh, there are very few things that I also just would stitch someone else's pattern because I'm not, I don't generally do that because I do design. Mm-hmm. But I would absolutely work on a reproduction of some of these just because they look so cool. And you can get yeah. kits that are reproductions of historic samplers. And that's, I mean, all you have to do is a Google search. I, I was, I went under the Google image search so that I could just be looking at those. And then there's like 
they give you know the little subcategories and those subcategories will take you down like specific historical yeah samplers the ackworth school is the um the specific group okay. of samplers that i find to be most um inspiring um they are schoolgirl samplers from a school called okay. ackworth and i i yeah. just love there's them. also like one of the categories was a forget me not which it seems to be like a historical one but also like that there's similar things in that category or there's the hannah gilpin sampler and then there's reproduction patterns of it and different ones that apparently hannah made uh but yeah it's it's really it is a a whole it is a whole world yeah and like a lot of these have historic significance and you can like you can learn all about the the different um Needle women who have made a lot of these because they their styles are so specific to them and so recognizable mm-hmm. that like much like some quilters, you can tell who did it, even though it's something as seemingly generic as cross stitch and you wouldn't think you would able be yeah. able to tell yeah. the difference. But you absolutely can. And I just, I think that is really, really yeah. interesting. Um, and I would have been mad if I had been made to do these as a schoolgirl, <laughs> I think. But, or maybe I would have really enjoyed it. I'm not sure. Um, but they are just so interesting and so weird. <laughs> And I married into a Quaker family. I had a Quaker wedding. Like, I have at least some insight into the traditions by way of my in-laws. And it is, there, there are some things that are very simple and straightforward about the culture. And then there are unexpected bursts of beauty and creativity and i think that's true in the religion also um because it's sort of like when you are inspired to act you are encouraged to do so and these kind of feel like the embodiment of that yeah i like that that's uh yeah and i didn't mean to just talk about quaker samplers but i guess i'm gonna (laughs) you know hey this is that's fine i you know one of the things that i had thought about and it's kind of goes along with this is um needlepoint and again yeah i you know needlepoint it has existed and been you know people have been doing needlepoint consistently since it began like it's not like oh well this only mm-hmm. happened a long time ago in the same way that people have been cross stitching samplers for forever but yeah maria antoinette even did her own needlepoint that's on display See, so you have these like very historic pieces um bargello embroidery is kind of one of those those things too it's you know it's like a form of needlepoint just in a in a different way yeah it and it looks very modern Mm -hmm. yeah but actually but it is it's yeah it's a very historic piece uh of a type of embroidery or or needlepoint and um yeah it obviously it has made a big comeback but it's it's very uh when you look at going back uh, a long while and see where it came from, uh, yeah, it's really cool. And the Victorian Albert Museum has, well, first of all, they they actually have a tutorial on their like their maker section of their website. They have a, a Bargello embroidery. Um, I am also looking at the Victorian Albert <laughs> yeah, Museum that's right. website, and so I uh, I love they have. Um, it's called Embroidery Styles, an Illustrated Guide. And one of the things that they have there are a pair of shoes uh, from somewhere between 1730 to 1740 using Bargello <laughs> embroidery. And yeah, it's like, it's really cool. And then there's another piece that they have. It's a chair seat 
made sometime between yeah. 1700 and 1750. And that's really where then we get to what I was thinking about with needlepoint is like my family is fortunate enough to have several pieces of like furniture. In fact, we finally we had duplicates of things. So we have passed them on to others. But like that that's wonderful. Yeah, I mean it's 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 cool to be able to have these things, but needlepoint is it can be tedious. I will say like a lot of these pieces were they had a, a large section that was stitched like in a solid color. It would have the, you know, like a rose motif in the middle and then a solid color all around it. But whether it's very detailed or just a solid color, that's a, it is a lot of of effort that was put in. Many, many hours over like in December, back in December, I stitched a very small needlepoint pillow for um, for a project, and it was fun to work on, but it was it was a lot of hours, right? Like I at some point I timed things out based on the number of stitches, and yeah, I, I've purposely forgotten how many hours I put into it because that would make me cry. But uh, <laughs> these these were literally things that they made so that then they could sit on them. Yes. Or put their feet on them. Or not. Or just have as a status symbol. That that also. Uh, but like my, let's see, my cousin's wife mm -hmm. was, she showed me a photo of a needlepoint piece that she has that her grandmother made. Mm -hmm. And it was initially made to be a piano bench cushion. Mm-hmm. Or cover. So a piano bench is not small. No. Oh, wow. And and the whole thing was needle pointed. It is now framed. She did not have I I can't remember why uh why the that didn't stay as that. But like I expect we looked the, at it. Um folded areas were stressed. It's yeah, I mean there or I she told me at some point but she sure. showed me and we looked at the thing she measured it we're taking like photos and stuff and that's this was so cool 10 count uh based on what we could measure from it being framed yeah uh here's i apparently did not do the math at that point but i just pulled this up uh if it had been eight count canvas it would have been over sixty thousand stitches Ow. I will I'll see if I can uh get a get the photo of this to to share with folks. But it was like the fact that this amazing detailed needlework was done and then you sat on it is just I it's a but that I blows love my mind. Using things. Yeah. Like my yeah. grandmother specifically, my my mom's mom gives me the family fill in the blank like the handmade stuff the embroidered stuff because i she knows i will use them she knows i know how to take yeah. care of them but she knows that i won't just let them sit in a drawer and right. i mean there are some things obviously that are museum quality that should not be used but when we're yeah. talking about everyday family items unless you're going to frame them I feel like there's great honor uh, uh, given to your ancestors if you use them. Yes. Uh, in the way that they were intended. I mean, some things were not intended to be used. Some things were intended to be decorative. Yeah. But many things weren't. Yeah. Um, I also just found something that blew my mind completely by accident. Okay. Um, I found the thing by accident. I guess it also accidentally blew my mind. <laughs> but when... I was, I had pulled up the uh, Victoria and Albert Museum article on the history of needlework samplers and hadn't looked at it. Uh -huh. And there is an example of needlework that looks just like it very, very clearly was several steps before. Um, Quaker needlework would have even existed from 14th to 16th century Egypt. That I looks love this. 
Yes. Like it it's a geometric mm-hmm. even weave fabric embroidery, but there are a bunch of them. Like I did not realize how far back some of these motifs went and like I understand that these motifs they like you can tell who's traveled where yeah. by what motifs pop up um mm-hmm. and when they do and so i my mind is just a little bit blown i realize that even weave fabric does lend itself to geometric embroidery but some of these things are like they're very recognizably similar yes to um what would eventually be quaker samplers uh well and i okay first of all i love that they refer to these as examplers <laughs> that's <laughs> that's a way better oh. word but the style that is in that egyptian piece yeah is very very similar and it makes sense that it would be to kasuti embroidery which is an indian embroidery style but mm. you know again Think about how, you know, where these methods originate and then how they would travel. And that makes sense because it's a a method where you like you stitch with running stitch and then you work backwards over those stitches in the same way that the embroidery like Holbein stitch does a similar thing. But this like the patterns have to like meet up and then it becomes the same on the front and the back of the piece. Oh, I see. I'm I'm now looking at that, and that's cool. But like I've, I've only ever seen, uh, example like more traditional Indian examples of it. This particular one from Egypt, like there's a cat in it. It's so cool. I mean, it's Egypt. <laughs> it's Egypt, exactly. But also, you have like the star shapes that you very traditional in Kasuti, also in, you know, quilting and all of those things. But yeah, it's, these just make me very excited. And yeah, yeah. well, it's so, I mean, it makes sense given that the population, like humans broadly Mm -hmm. were there and then historically expanded to other places Yep. And so you do get um, more isolated populations that develop specific techniques that are disconnected from those original lines just mm-hmm. by way of a population being isolated. But it's, I love that when you're looking, especially at specific kinds of making it becomes incredibly clear how connected people are. Yes. And that sounds kind of corny, but like you can see the direct lines that connect different people from different places as they moved further away. And I just, I think that's, really really cool especially in a world where at the moment it seems pretty divided and chaotic yeah that it makes me very happy to see an example or to be able to see how we all kind of do things the same way and it makes sense that we would do them kind of in the same way but yeah you oh, don't absolutely. Often, you don't often stop to think oh well this was just the logical next step or, you know, whatever. But, um, right. yeah. And I just, if you, if this kind of stuff excites you, definitely like spend some time on the VNA Museum website because they have so- the VNA Museum website is amazing. <laughs> yes. It's they just, do a really good job. Yeah. If you have the opportunity to visit at some point, some point someday if you can go and visit there like do it because it's Ooh, i have not oh. because i've only been to airports in london well it's i've been there twice and i still haven't seen the whole or at thing. least i assume it's in london yes it is it is oh wait i know that yeah. i know that from 
the book red white and royal blue okay <laughs> yeah. yeah um it's uh it's overwhelming uh to be honest but it's it's so cool yeah. so yeah yeah i mean i and i've mentioned this before i have a friend who works in the textile department at the met and so because it's a public museum you can have them pull uh yeah things from the collection so you can see them yeah and most people don't know that and very few people do that but you can have them pull a specific number of items and then just go in and look at them and that just it blows my mind in a slightly less overwhelming way because i am (laughs) well i I imagine going back into the storage areas where all of these are kept would probably break my brain. Yeah. But. That would be amazing, though. Okay. I mean, can you imagine? Uh, I mean, I can maybe more than imagine. Well, sure. <laughs> <laughs> sure, you can. You can. Uh, uh, but, oh, yeah. my goodness. It's. Yeah. Uh, and, and that is a short history. Like, American history does right. not have the breadth that European history and definitely not of Middle Eastern history. Right. Um, And I mean, some of the items obviously are not from American uh, descent because that is not the point of this particular museum. Right. But yeah, I, I, I think I would just have full sensory overload. (laughs) Like my, like autistic me would just freeze with eyes wide and take it all in and I would still be standing in the same position 12 hours later as the lights turned off. <laughs> uh, and then they just... And not even in a bad way. Just... Then they just like crate you and you become part of the collection. That's fine. <laughs> I have plenty of time to get used to it. There you go. There you go. <laughs> I I could be Mothwatch. Perfect. Perfect. They they would have the right person for that. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, I I guess I I saw this possibly going other directions, but while we're here, um, the can we just talk about embroidered pockets? Ah, <gasps> there is an entire book devoted to the history of them. No, really? Oh my goodness! Yes. Oh boy. I don't remember what it's called. I will find it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We're gonna need that. Um, because it's, I mean, again. Ah, uh, it's called The Pocket. The Pocket, a okay. A hidden history of women's lives. <sighs> I love it. I love it. Yeah, I'll drop it in, um, or I'll drop the Goodreads link in. Okay, thank you, thank you. I don't own it, but it's been on my list forever, and it also has the very embroidery that you're thinking of, mm-hmm. or that we've been discussing. Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. You know, first of all, I, the idea of tying on your own pockets for garments that don't have pockets, like, you'd look ridiculous now, but, because you obviously oh, don't. Oh, it's making a comeback. I, I believe it. I mean, if you think about I've it. I've been watching it all over. It's been making a really interesting comeback. Even, like, things like, like, hip pouches or, you know, you oh, know yeah. all of those. Women are over not having pockets yeah. on everything, and when they don't exist, more often now they are just being like no i'm not actually busying my hands with other things i'm just going to wear this hip pouch or this the the kind of thing that you could add to a belt would be it's perfect right because that's it it, yeah you're not like tying it on obviously so many of these historic pockets were worn under clothing and yet they were still well under clothing that was that had slits yes. in it. Yeah. Like, you could, in fact, get to the right, pockets. Right, exactly. Yes, yes, yes. You just needed to know the inner workings yeah. of your but, garment. Like, we don't have garments that would even accommodate that if you were to put the slits in place. That's just not, you know, when we're talking about, like, like a pair of jeans, jeans with, with pockets that are <laughs> yes. postage stamp size. Yeah. Or, or sewn shut, because you're not actually supposed to put anything in them. Um, that, oh, right? I get my seam ripper out immediately. Uh, yeah. If anything arrives with the pocket sewn shut. I'm using it. Yeah. And I don't care yeah. what you think. But, like, <laughs> once again, these pockets, which 
could not be seen from the outside are incredibly adorned. Yeah. Well, so were many, many, like, when you're thinking back to, I guess, even 18th century, like the sig- or Victorian, yeah. um, the significant layers, especially in women's dress, really particularly in women's dress, there are so many fine details on so many layers of things that literally only the woman and her lady's maid would ever see. Mm-hmm. Like, not even spouses yeah. <laughs> would see most of these things. And I will say that this is per- specifically pertaining to um, upper-class society sure. women. I imagine that the uh, the layers were a bit more utilitarian yeah, um, yeah, yeah. or inherited from, like if you happen to be household staff, you might inherit uh, for Boxing Day. The history of Boxing Day, in fact, is people um, from estates boxing up treats and um, things to give to their servants and they get the day after Christmas off and take the boxes home to uh, enjoy them. See, there you go. I guess I had not looked into that, that history, but well, now it's, well, yeah, like I know. you're boxing up the stuff that you don't want, I think uh, to donate or yeah. do whatever. It's not dissimilar, but I just and I heard it on a podcast. I'm going to say that I, well, I a do not remember what podcast it was. Um, but it was a British one. Okay, so yeah, I feel fairly confident that they did their research. Okay. Um, well, but anyway, and so I also um we this goes back maybe a couple years now when we talked about the Kirsten Project with yes. um, Jessica Quirk, and so she made. The so this is like the American Girl doll Kirsten, and she has made yes. life size costumes for herself based on the doll's outfits. And one of those one of those accessories that Kirsten had was a little um a little pocket, a waist pocket, I think is what is officially uh, referred to in this particular case. And it is yeah, designed. Yeah, hers is really really pretty. Yeah, it's designed to be worn on the outside. And I she did. I remember. Uh, a post that she had showing, oh, she calls it a loose pocket or, oh, there's a, there's a Swedish word for it. Kjolsak. I might have that wrong because even though my family is Swedish, I don't speak Swedish, but um, that sounds about right. Yeah. Um, But so there, that's like a whole other category. Is that extra pocket? She's translating it as loose pocket or extra bag. Um, Okay, but I'm just going with what I know from uh, it being close enough to German for me to. Okay, yeah, but so that's like they have their own like in Scandinavian tradition. You see their own version of these kinds of pockets, and yeah, they're so cool. And I just they are really cool. And and yeah, the it does make me want to create a modern version for myself or to to share because it is it's exactly the kind of thing that people still are seeking it is and i've actually weirdly been all week trying to find a hip pouch with a i mean basically it's a hip holster but with a thigh strap okay because that would be very helpful navigating the subway and not like bonking people oh yeah with Um, withholding things, not that I am taking the train these days, (laughs) but I can't find one that isn't wider than me. Okay. And so I, I'm going to need to design one because I, they're largely designed to be for men and women. And I just happen to fall on the far end of that possibility. But see, I feel like that just means that... You need one that would also fit, like, a teenager, really. I want you to know, related to that, just 
so you can shake your head with me. I had to purchase a new bike helmet this week. Uh huh. And I had to purchase it in youth small. Wow. <laughs> oh, you've got a small head. I just come on. No wonder I've always looked like I was wearing like another head on top of my head with adult um, bike helmets. Uh, but anyway, um, just under twenty-one inches. In case anyone was wondering. okay. Um, <laughs> oh my! And babies have big heads, so okay. Well, it's true. Your it's he- true. head circumference doesn't grow all that. It's much true. After a certain trust point. me, my my brother. My brother Anders, who really helped us get yeah. a lot of things set up for this podcast, shout yes, out to him. Love Anders. Um, he had <laughs> he had an enormous head as a as a baby, to the point where we <laughs> joke that it may not have actually sh- changed all that much since then. He had a very large. It's head. entirely possible. Yeah, it was actually kind of adorable. So <laughs> okay, that's really funny, and I'm sorry <clears throat> to take it down that rabbit hole. It's just that. It's all right. I'm telling you, I'm over here. I'm over here scrolling through the Kjallsaks from the Digital Museum in Sweden, and I'm putting it in the show notes, and everyone is just going to. Oh, please do. Oh. Yeah. Yes. I feel it. Maybe we should um, make a Patreon level specifically for getting this thing that we will inevitably design at some point. Yeah. I, I also, as you, it's. <laughs> As you were saying the one, what you need, I was thinking, we should design these in tandem and release them together. <laughs> well, I'm glad that we still are reading each other's minds. Uh-huh. We've been overlapping a lot today. We have, but... and I, oh, I like it. Oh, these are amazing. <laughs> it's, it's an extensive list. Um, well, I love the, like, clamshell design, the, the metallic clamshell design that has... Like almost a gigantic jewelry loop for going around for going onto belts. Mm-hmm. Well, that seems like something I would break immediately. Yeah, some of these. But also, I love. Yeah, it. some of these are very much like a uh, coin purse with the really, you know, again yeah. satisfying little snap top kind of a thing. But then they well, can these hang. remind me of chatelaine. Yeah, yeah, but. For wearing around your waist. I have a chatelaine hanging right next to my head. Of course you do. Of course you do. A real one. I again, I'm I'm a little envious because that is on my list of things too. The, I think the first time I ever saw saw a chatelaine was at the VNA Museum. Because it all seems to be connected. Yeah. yeah. I, everything goes back to the VNA Museum. I don't think there has ever been an episode that we've had that I couldn't have found something related to it That's at the V&A. Probably, probably true. It is like, like craft history museum unofficially, I would say. I mean, yeah, I really officially, like probably. <laughs> well, yeah, but you know, like, yeah. it, it, no one has officially declared it to be that, but it's as close as you will ever get. So, yeah. I don't know what the mission statement of the v actually is. Uh. I don't know. You have to ask Victoria and Albert what they were thinking about it. I've researched that once. That doesn't help because I don't remember. Yeah. Well, gosh, these, I mean, and by the way, this, this particular collection of these pockets, they're, I mean, unfortunately, a lot of the things to go along with it are in Swedish. So you would have, you have to go through some extra steps to get to, to reading them if you're an English speaker, however, or a speaker of any language really. But um, but it's, there's a lot of information. It's really cool. All right. I haven't even. So the Victorian Albert is, according to itself, um, the world's leading museum of art and design, housing a permanent collection of over 2.3 million objects that spanned over 5,000 years of human creativity. All right. Yep. Uh, the museum holds many of the UK's national collection and houses some of the greatest resources for the study of architecture, furniture, fashion, textiles, photography, sculpture, painting, jewelry, glass, ceramics, book arts, Asian art and design, theater and performance. 
I didn't wow. expect that to keep going. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so that's official enough. I'm just going to put this out here that this this digital museum that I have that I'm going to it'll be in the show notes with the with the pockets but they It's really cool. They have also um a whole lot of other stuff to to explore including like some tapestries that are wow you know we could do we could discuss tapestries at length i guess in needlepoint we're kind of getting into that but yeah yeah. um we should go see the unicorn tapestry next time you're here yeah because i haven't been up to the cloisters okay all right it's a plan someday it will happen (laughs) you know at some point Uh, at some point but anyway this was like Honestly, I wasn't sure how this episode would would go, but I I thought we would I I didn't expect to end up so like deep into these exciting beautiful things and yet I'm so thankful that we did. Yeah. A little all over the place, but you know, less this all is what over happens. the place than we had planned to be. True. True. We we ended up focusing more. Uh we do that. But... <laughs> <laughs> well, if you uh for those of you listening, I hope that you explore some of these things on your own as well. We'll we'll try and get some good good show note links here yeah. for you. But yeah, it this is this is how ideas are born. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And I mean also how crafters are made. Yeah. Because yeah. there are reasons that people have been picking up needles and colored threads for as long as humans have had the option for either of those things. Um, yes. And, uh, no, I was going to go down the uh, prehistoric path of that, and I'm just going to leave that alone. <laughs> yep. We, we've already, we've, we've had like, we've already gone down enough paths of, of glorious I agree. things, but yeah. Shall I wrap us up then? <laughs> yes, let's do that. <laughs> All right. Um, and, uh, on that very, very exciting note, (laughs) thanks for listening to the Very Serious Crafts podcast. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Serious Crafts and on Facebook at Very Serious Crafts. You can also find show notes and all things Very Serious Crafts at VerySeriousCrafts.com. And finally, if you are a fan of the Very Serious Crafts podcast, please leave us a five-star review on whichever platform you use to listen to podcasts. Because, as every other podcast in the world has already told you, good ratings help us show up in recommendations, which really does help more people who love crafting find us. And and now, now we just have to go and uh, try not to start making pockets <laughs> we're gonna make pockets Spoiler it's gonna alert. happen i know it's gonna happen mm-hmm. i know i don't I know. think it's going to happen in the immediate future because no. we're both busy exactly exactly but um that has never stopped us before i don't know what i'm even saying I... <laughs> yeah it's kind of like it's kind of like me deciding to you know just on the spur of the moment, try to put together a puzzle when I really should not be putting it together a puzzle. It's a I've pretty been puzzle. Sucked, it is a pretty puzzle. I've been sucked into the jigsaw puzzle. Yeah, uh, I might thing, actually but, have to know. get that puzzle too, Jeremy and yeah. I like to put puzzles together. Okay. All right. Oh, good. Well, then puzzles will have to just be another topic of conversation at some point. So I'm it's sure true. That there's a, I'm sure there's a good craft connect, connection for us. Although we are now going to transition into things we should not start. So if you aren't That's already true. a uh, me- member of our Patreon, go do that and uh, we'll follow down yeah. some more bad idea, great idea rabbit holes. <laughs> All right. right. Bye for now. Bye.